Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we just pray as we go through Genesis that you would help us understand that you are creator, God. You created everything. And Lord, what a glorious creation you put together. We see a glimpse of it today, and we will see it again one day in the kingdom age. We just pray, speak to our hearts tonight, draw us close to you. And Lord, as we worship you, may we glorify you with these songs. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 as we're continuing our study uh, through the Word of God. And last week we began our third time through the Bible. Uh, we didn't finish this chapter last uh, in our last study, but the reason I'm taking my time going through this is because this is so foundational. I guarantee you, you get this down, the rest of the Bible is easy. If you doubt what th is said here, you're going to have problems with the rest of the Bible. It's just easy to see. And here's the thing. Why do people not believe this? I think it's interesting, this attack on creation, because they attack at the foundation. That's what the world does. They attack the foundation. It's not all the other issues. Here's the foundation. You, you destroy Genesis. Why do you need a savior? Why? What's the point? But God has created all life, everything from nothing. Leonard Susskind, in his book, The Cosmic Lands Landscape, String Theory and the Illusion of Intelligent Design. So it's just an illusion that we're so complex and all that. But this is what he wrote. Two stories are possible. The first is creationist. God made man with some purpose that involved man's ability to appreciate and worship God. Let's forget that story. The whole point of science is to avoid such stories. So the whole point of science is to discredit God. No, I thought science was to discover truth, right? But you see, they have to get rid of God. And think about it. Why have so many people, children, lost hope? Why do we see so many kids today committing suicide? Think about it. You know, when I was a kid, we just did kid stuff. We didn't have all that pressure. It's because they lost hope. Evolution has given them no hope. Think about it. Think about the philosophy of religion. This is from a book called Darwinianism, Science or Naturalistic Philosophy. And listen to what they said. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. Well, that makes me feel really good. There is no purpose. There is nothing out there. And there, this stuff is crammed down the throats of kids, that there's no God, there's no purpose to life, no goals. And then you wonder why they lost hope. Julian Huxley, in his book Essays of a Humanist, said, in the evolutionary pattern of thought, there is no longer either need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So did all the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human selves, mind and soul, as well as brain and body, and so did religion. So again, the whole point is, with evolution, is to take God completely out of the picture. Life is not important. Life is just a random chance happening. So here's the thing, if you kill someone, if you take your own life, if you murder a baby in the womb through abortion, it doesn't matter because life's not important. Do you see that? They, they removed the importance of life. So killing someone, what's the big deal in their mind? That is why Darwinianism, evolution, is attacking these first 11 chapters of Genesis, and especially these first two. They're trying to destroy it. Evolution tells us everything came from nothing and from no information to more and more and more information and the outcome, amoeba to ma'am. You just need long periods of time for that to happen. That makes absolutely no sense. It's not even a good theory, and yet they moved evolution from a theory to a fact, right, today? Evolution is taught as a fact. And have they found evidence to support this so-called theory? Absolutely not. Leon Lederman, who was a Nobel Prize win winning physicist, said when you read or hear anything about the birth of the universe, Someone is making it up. 
Well, that's not science, guys, is it? They're making it up. We don't know how it happened, so we're just going to throw this out there. Both creation and evolution are based on faith because none of us were there when it happened. What we do have is the evidence. And we're both looking at the same evidence and we're coming to our conclusions. Their conclusion is it's billions of years life evolved. Our conclusion is when we look at life, all the records show that it just appeared. There are no transitional forms. And we'll look at that a little tonight. Discover Magazine tells us the universe bursts into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. You would think that's a fairy tale, right? You read that. This isn't Discover Magazine, a science magazine. So everything came from nothing, and it keeps getting more stuff out of nothing, nowhere. Wow, that takes a lot of faith. The best evidence we have shows that life cannot occur spontaneously out of nothing unless God created something out of nothing, and that's what Genesis tells us. Only God could do that. And it's not my opinion, guys. Evolutionists believe that there is no evidence for evolution, and yet they hold on to it. Why? Why are they holding on to something where there's no evidence? Because what's the other alternative? Oh, that there is a God who created everything, and we don't want to believe that. George Wald points that out. When it comes to the origin of life, there are only two possibilities. Creation or spontaneous generation. There's no third way. Spontaneous generation was disproved 100 years ago, but that leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on, a philosoph on philosophical grounds. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible that life arose spontaneously by chance. Now, is that science? We're choosing what is totally impossible to happen, life arising out of non-life, but the other alternative is God, and we don't want to believe in God, so as scientists, we're believing in what is impossible. That's not science, again, that's faith. Paul Davis, who is professor of physics at Arizona State University, wrote this in a magazine called New Scientist. We now know that the secret of life lies not with the chemical ingredients as such, but with the logical structure and organizational arrangement of the molecules. Like a supercomputer, life is an information processing system. It is the software of the living cell that is the real mystery, not the hardware. How did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? Nobody knows. And yet they believe it, that it just happened. I don't know about you, but for me, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's that simple. It is so simple when you look at life. Nehemiah 9.6 says, You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worship you. Absolutely. And so that's our introduction. Let's pick up Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 20 as we continue our study through the word of God. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abound, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So on the fifth day of creation, God created all the creatures that live in the sea and all the creatures that fly in the air. Now, let's start with these sea creatures. It's been estimated that there are over one million different species that live in the oceans. And 91% of them haven't even been identified yet. Are you kidding me? And I couldn't even find estimates of how many creatures live in the sea, the totality of them. Now, in regards to birds, there's all, over 10,000 different species. They estimated the number of birds at 430 billion uh, birds. I think we've got a majority of the seagulls. I don't know, but they seem to be around here. So God says that the waters are going to be filled with life. The sky is going to be filled with life. Is that what we see? Yeah, the, the evidence is there. And they appear suddenly. 
Why? Because God created them. You know, we always said, what came first, the chicken or the egg? That was the big thing when I was in school to debate. The chicken, of course, because God created the chicken. It just makes sense. And this didn't happen over millions of years. God spoke it, and it happened. And I realize that there are some who think, you know, but Pastor Joe, does, doesn't the fossil record prove that life slowly evolved over time and this life got more and more and complex and here we are today from the primordial soup to man? No, that's what evolution tells us. It's not what the evidence shows us and it's not what the Bible says. How do you get from no information to complex life forms? Absolutely nothing to absolutely everything. It makes no sense. Even Richard Dawkins, an evolutionist, states that life just appeared. There's no tra transitional forms, none. And this is what he said. He said, it is though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Of course it does. Life just appeared, he's saying, because God created it. <laughs> They, don't, they have to suppress that truth to negate that there is a God who's done this. He should be, a, as a scientist, looking at the evidence, right? He's not there to make a judgment because he doesn't want to believe in God. Look at the evidence. Life just appeared. It didn't happen through evolutionary processes. There must be a God is the conclusion. That's science. And look at the variety of sea life. How did it just happen? Now, is there evolutionary changes or changes in life? Yeah, there is microevolution where you have small minor changes, but not macroevolution where you have, you know, a, a dog turning into a cat or whatever, something obscene like that. You know, you look at the varieties of birds and fish and all kinds of life, but they're not transforming into another creature. I mean, I don't think people have thought about this, but imagine... As a woman, you go into the hospital to have a baby, and you're going to wonder, is that kid going to fly out of my womb? That's evolution. Well, that's not science. One author said this. He said, evolutionists often give convincing examples of microevolution, the variation of a kind within its kind, adapting to the environment. For example, the ratio of black to white peppered moss may increase when pollution makes it easier for dark moss to escape detection. Or finches may develop different beaks in response to their distinctive environment. But the moths are still moths, and the finches are still finches. There has been no change outside of the kind. Microevolution does not prove macroevolution. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because Discover Mag Magazine, not a Christian magazine, rated the greatest scientific thinker in history as Sir Isaac Newton, a Christian. And he was mocked because his contemporaries couldn't understand why he believed that there was really a God who created the world in six days. You think we have problems today. They even mocked him back then, right? And he had a friend, Sir Isaac Newton, who, like himself, was a scientist. Um, and you know, Newton loved the Lord Jesus. His friend was not a Christian. He didn't believe that there was a God. And he had spoken to his friend many times about how God created the wonderful universe and his friend would shake his head saying, no, and reply that the universe just happened. So Newton had just finished the design of a scale model of our solar system, and he had a very skilled craftsman built it from the plans that Newton put together. And in the center was a large ball made of brass, which represented the sun. Revolving around the sun was smaller balls attached to spokes of different lengths. And these balls represented the planets and the spokes place them at the proper distance from the sun. All of these balls representing you know, Mercury, Mercury, Venus, and so on were in the proper order. Now, they were also geared together so that when a crank on the front of the front was turned, they all moved in the orbits around the sun. And one day Newton was in his study reading, and his friend came to visit him, and his friend saw the model and instantly recognized what it was, obviously. And he gave the model a little crank, and he studied it. And he said to Newton, this is tremendous. Who made it? Newton said, nobody. Well, his friend was a little confused and said, you must not have heard me. I asked, who made this wonderful model? 
And Newton looked up and with a perfectly straight face said, nobody made it. Those balls and gears just appeared and put themselves together. His friend was pretty upset at what he said, and he said, you must think I'm a fool. Of course, somebody made this. He's a genius, and I'd like to meet him. Newton set his book aside and slowly walked across the room to his friend. And as they stood in front of the model, Newton explained to his friend, this model is just a poor imitation of our wonderful universe. You know the laws and the precise order which govern our universe. I can't seem to convince you that this model, this toy, does not have a designer or a maker. However, you said many times that the solar system, which this model represents, just happened. Now tell me, is that the logical conclusion of a scientist? What a challenge, right? And his friend understood it. He was open. He, ha he realized there had to be a master designer and creator for everything. And he accepted the Lord and as his savior and obviously six-day creation. You know, the problem today is that many don't get it or they don't want to get it because evidence for creation is overwhelming. J.R. Norman said, the geological record has so far provided no evidence as to the origin of the fishes. And shortly after the time when fish-like fossils made their appearance in the rocks, already differentiation from each other and firmly established, are represented by a number of diverse and often specialized types. What is he saying? He's saying they're form these fish are all fully formed. There's no transitional forms. They're already what they look like now. And the birds, man, where do birds come from? Well, one of the big things, you know, you, you see uh, Jurassic Park, you know, the they're great science fiction shows. They're great entertainment, but they're not science guys. Um, but they say that birds came from dinosaurs. Really? Where's the evidence? There is no evidence. But here's what they say. How birds got wings, these little creatures, these little dinosaurs, not the big ones, they were chasing after these insects on the ground, and they were flapping their wings. And they slowly developed wings so they could fly and get the insects. They would have died before they got wings, right? The other one is these creatures went up into the tree, and they couldn't get down. And they had to wait until they developed wings. I mean, this is what their answers are. I'm not making this up. I would be embarrassed to come up with that. W.E. Swinton said, the evolutionary origin of birds is largely a matter of deduction. There's no fossil evidence of the stages through which the remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. What did he just say? There's no evidence for it, but that's what happened. Are you kidding me? That's, again, not science. They suppress the truth, Paul said in Romans, to believe the lie. The evidence is right there before them. It's smacking them in the face. And they worship the creature instead of the creator. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. Before I got saved, that's where I was at. I believed, you know, I was a relative, a monkey's uncle, I don't know. And the evidence is not there. We'll see that tonight. Philip Johnson said, and he's an evolutionist. If evolution means the gradual change of one kind of organism into another kind, the outstanding characteristic of the fossil record is the absence of evidence for evolution. Why are we teaching it in schools? There's no evidence for it. Is that incredible? They even are saying this stuff. They admit it. The Bighorn Basin in Wyoming contains a continuous record of fossil deposits, which geologists say is five million years. And because this record is so complete, paleontologists assume there's going to be a trail of evolution there that can be found. And this is what, again, Johnson said, the fossil record does not convincingly document a single transition from one species to another. Not one. Evolutionist Niall Eldridge we paleontologists have said that the history of life in the fossil record supports the story of gradual evolution, all the while knowing that it does not. In other words, we're lying. We know it doesn't support it. 
And so we're teaching these kids a lie. Wow. Stephen Jay Gould bluntly admitted, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The rare rarity of it, there is none. That's pretty rare. There's zero, nada. Eldridge and Gould noted, most species during their geological history either do not change in any appreciable way or else they fluctuate mildly in morphology with no apparent direction. Wow. There are no transitional forms in the fossil record. That's what he wrote. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediate stages between major transitions in organic design, indeed our inability, even our imagination, to construct functional intermediates in many cases has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. That's why they came up with the hopeful monster theory. That, you know, a dinosaur laid an egg and a bird came out. That's their hopeful monster. Something huge, big transitions, not small gradual changes, because there's no evidence for it. Everything is fully formed in the fossil record. That's not science, guys, when you believe that, because the evidence doesn't support it. That's fiction. Look at verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and, the, and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God is creating now the various forms of land creatures on the sixth day of creation. And what does it say after its each own kind? Okay? Doesn't trans, not a ma macro evolution. Yeah, micro's dif evolution, differences within the kind, but not a different kind. It's been estimated that there are some 6.5 million different types of species of land creatures. And 86% of them haven't been discovered yet. That's crazy when you think about that. And this happened by random chance? Come on. Scientists can test evolution in their labs with insects. Because insects reproduce very quickly. You have many, many different generations. Um, they experimented with fruit flies, 80,000 generations of fruit flies. They bombarded them with all kinds of radiations. And you know what they ended up with? Fruit flies. <laughs> That's a great experiment, huh? And this is the conclusion. Yeah, some of the mutations were harmful to these creatures, you know, but um, the conclusion one professor came up with is that the data shows a fruit fly has evolved as far as it can go. Are you kidding me? That's your conclusion? What does it show? It shows a flu fly can only reproduce after its own kind. That's the reality. And you can apply it across the board. No transitional forms of any creature, plant, animal, or fish. George Gaylord Simpson said, this regular absence of transitional forms is not confined to mammals, but is an almost universal ph phenomenon. As long and as has long been noted by paleontologists. So they, again, they know this, but they refuse to believe. This is from Quarterly Review of Biology, an article on animal evolution. Thus, so far as concerns the major groups of animals, the creationists seem to have the better of the argument. There is not the slightest evidence that any of the major groups ever arose from any other. You would think, as a scientist, okay, I know this, that it can happen, and the other alternative is there's a God, and that they would come to saving faith. Now, yes, some have, but many, many suppress the truth. Think about the little insect, the bombardier beetle. I love the bombardier beetle. It's a cool little insect, only one half of an inch in length, and there is no possible way this thing could have evolved. None. See, the creature has a defense mechanism that can only work if all the parts are fully formed and functional. 
irreducible complexity is what it's called. And so when it, can at when it attacks, it fires from twin exhaust tubes at its tail and boiling hot noxious gases with a loud pop go towards its enemies. That's how it protects itself. German chemist Dr. Uh, Schinken, I can't even say his, the German name, he discovered that the beetle mixes two chemicals, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinine together. And it has a special inhibitor to keep the mixture from reacting. Well, then how does it react if there's something inhibiting it? Well, it has this specially designed combustion tubes, and there's two enzymes called catalyst and peroxidase that make chemical reactions go millions of times faster. So this, these chemicals catalyze the extremely ra rapid decomposition of the hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, and the oxidation of hydroquinine into quinine, causing them to violently react and explode. But at just the right time so the beetle's butt doesn't blow off. How does evolution explain that? How many beetles lost their butts until those, everything was put together. And it could fire off four or five bombs in succession. It doesn't have to reload, really. Can you imagine? That is a great defense mechanism. Again, this is irreducible complexity, or that the creature had to be fully formed and not evolved. French mathematician Le Comte de Noy examine the laws of possibility for a single molecule of high dissymmetry to be formed by the action of chance. Single molecule, okay? Denoy found that on, the, on an average, the time needed to form one such molecule of our terrestrial globe would be about 10 to the 253 billion of years. Well, the Earth is only, they say, what, four, five, even 10 million? This isn't even close. But that's not the end of what is written. He continued, but let us admit that no matter how small the chance it could happen, one mo molecule could be created by such astronomical odds of chance. However, one molecule is of no use. Hundreds of millions of identical ones are necessary. Thus, we either admit the miracle or doubt the absolute truth of science. I think we admit the miracle. I mean, if the odds in Las Vegas were like what he's saying, no one would go to Las Vegas. You would never win. And yet this is what they say. Leslie Orgel, one of the world's leading authorities on the origin of life studies, an evolutionist, said this. It is extremely improbable that proteins and nucleic acids, both of which are structurally complex, arose spontaneously in the same place at the same time. Yet it also seems impossible to have one without the other. And so at first glance, one might have to conclude that life could never, in fact, have originated by chemical means. In other words, life can't come from non-life. You take a good look at the land creatures from insects to cows to horses and on and on and on, there is no chance that that happened by random chance. Impossible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I want to look at this verse a little closer. It reads, Then God, Elohim, in the plural, said, singular verb in Hebrew, Let us, again plural, make man in our image. Again, plural. What does that mean? Because I think it means... It's talking about the Godhead, the Trinity. From Genesis 1-1 on through Revelation 22-21, there is one God manifested in three distinct persons. Here's the big question that people have all kinds of ideas about. Who's God talking to? God said, let us make man in our own image. Who's he talking to? Well, some feel that it's speaking of the plurality of royalty. That God is so magnificent that they have to speak of him as many different people. There is nowhere in the scriptures you will find it used that way. Absolutely nowhere in the scriptures. 
So, I mean, that's an easy one to say, forget about it. Some say it's angels. Well, let me ask you this. Can angels create anything? No. Only God is the creator. So does God say, hey, angels, I need some help over here creating? Absolutely not. So this is not speaking of angels. It's clearly speaking of the triune God. One God manifested in three distinct persons, and now the creation of man in their own image. This is important for us to understand. There is a difference in creation in the things that God created. I'll deal with plants, trees, grasses, and the like. And I don't want to offend anyone here, because if you talk with your plants, good for you. You're, they're not listening, but they really like the carbon dioxide that you're speaking to them with. They can't talk to you. They can't hear you. Why? Because they're one-dimensional creation. They have a body, so they are alive, but they have no consciousness. Then there are animals and birds and sea creatures and insects and the like. And as much as we love our pets and these other creatures, except for spiders, my wife does not like spiders, so I'll, I'll put that in there. These things are two-dimensional. What do I mean? They have a body, obviously, they're alive, but they're different from plants because they have a soul or a consciousness, but they don't have a spirit. What does the spirit do? The spirit is in communication with God. So they're alive, they have a body, and they have a soul, a consciousness. Here's the difference. Man. When Adam was created, he was a three-dimensional creature, a body, soul, or consciousness, and spirit. He was a triune being, just like Almighty God. And when sin entered the world, the spirit died. Prior to that, all the things that Adam was manifesting in his life was pure and undefiled. It was the fruit of the Spirit, I believe, was flowing from the life of Adam. And then sin entered. And when his spirit died, that relationship with God was broken. And sin separated Adam from God, just as it, sin separates us from God. And that's the whole reason Jesus came to restore that fellowship. Do you understand why Genesis is so important? It lays the groundwork for why God became flesh and dwelt among us and went to the cross of Calvary. Now, also, man is to oversee creation, to have dominion over it. And when God created everything, it was good, very good. There's a beautiful relationship. But now when we look out in the world, we see the effects of sin, not only upon man, but upon all of creation. Well, let's look at the creation of man. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, I don't know how much clearer God can be on this. He created man fully formed, not evolving over millions of years. In fact, like I said last time, the earth is probably only some 6,000 years old. Darwin, you know, we think that he, he was completely sold out on evolution. He really wasn't. He made this interesting comment. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And it has. It's broken. And it should be thrown in the trash because it's garbage. Think about the heart. What's the function of the heart without blood vessels? It's useless, right? Well, I mean, you need blood vessels. A heart just pumping is... is Totally useless. But 
you can have heart and blood vessels, but don't you need blood? Well, yeah, you need the blood, but how are you going to survive because you've got to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide, so you have to have lungs to do that. But what if you cut yourself? You'll bleed to death. So you have to have platelets that come on and prevent you from bleeding to death. But what about infection? Well, you need white blood cells to come. Do you see how complex it is? You can't have one without the other. You know, the pH system, regulated by the lungs and the kidneys. Our pH balance is very narrow. If we become too acidic, we're going to die. Too alkaline, we're going to die. It has to be just right. How does that happen by random chance? How many of these creatures had to die because it didn't fit? You see, it's so complex. You know, I love watching uh, the commercials that, you know, for National Geographic and some of these shows because they're hilarious. They go, and we're going to be looking at the shark who over millions of years hasn't changed. Thinking, did you hear what you just said? You just denied evolution. Of course it didn't change. In an article in Bite magazine from way back in 1985, John Stephen Stevens compares the single processing ability of the cells in the retina with that of the most sophistic, sophisticated computer designed by man, the Cray supercomputer. And again, this is years ago, but listen. While today's digital hardware is extremely impressive, it is clear that the human's retina's real-time performance goes unchallenged. Actually, to simulate 10 milliseconds, one hundredth of a second of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneously nonlinear differential equations a hundred times and would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer. Keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complex ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of Cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Are you kidding me? And it just happened? Professor Richard Goldsmith, a geneticist at the University of California at Berkeley, listed a series of complex structures from the hair of mammals to hemoglobin. He thought he could not have been uh, produced by thousands of years of small mutations. And this is what he wrote. The Darwinians met this fantastic suggestion with savage ridicule. As Goldsmith put it, this time I was not only crazy but almost a criminal. To suppose that such a random event could reconstruct even a single complex organ like a liver or kidney is about as reasonable as to suppose that an improved watch can be designed by throwing an old one against the wall. Yeah, why don't you believe? Life is complex. The cell is the most complex and most elegantly designed system man has ever witnessed. Michael Denton, in his book entitled Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, explains the com the, this complexity with an example. He says, to grasp the reality of life as has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity, a complexity beyond our own creative capacities, a reality which is the very antithesis of chance, which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man. One person describes the reality he faced as a scientist who had been told throughout his life that life had emerged as a result of chance coincidences. From my earliest training as a scientist, I was very strongly brainwashed to believe that science cannot be consistent with any kind of deliberate creation. That notion has had to be painfully shed. At the moment, I can't find any rational argument to knock down the view which argues for conversion to God. We used to have an open mind. Now we realize that the only logical answer to life is creation and not accidental, random shuffling. 
Wow. I mean, I, you know, do they listen to what they're saying and writing? Now, I know some, but what about the evolution of man, Pastor Joe? We have the fossil record to show us there is a transition from ape-like creatures to man-like creatures. No, there isn't. Can I prove it? Absolutely. I'll show you. Ramapithecus. Supposed to be 12 to 14 million years old, found in the uh, Siwalik uh, Hills in Northeast India in 1932 by G.E. Lewis. He found a two-inch piece of jawbone and later a few small pieces of a jawbone and a few teeth. From that, from what they found, they were able, this is incredible what they were able to do. It's amazing what science can do. They determined the creature's height, his posture, length of limbs, shape of his head, and the amount of body hair. That is one heck of a fish story. You cannot determine that stuff with what he found. One of the problems, and yeah, there are many, is that bones say nothing about the fleshy parts of the nose, lips, or ears. Then how did they come to it? Well, he says, artists must create something between an ape and a human being. The older the specimen is said to be, the more ape-like they make it. Oh, how old are those fossils? 12 million years old. Well, then he's got to look like this and walk like this, all hunched over like an ape. He's got to be hairy. That's conjecture. That's a story. It's not science. In the 1970s, they did find complete jaws of uh, Ramapithecus, uh, Andrews, Walker, Walker Leakey, and Pelbing. Um, and they were U-shaped, belonging to an ape, not egg-shaped, which would be a human jaw. So here's the thing. Ramapithecus is not on his way to becoming human. You know what he is? He's an extinct orangutan. Wow. He can be removed from the evolutionary char charts. Australopithecus, the most famous, you know, he's supposed to be one to four million years old, is the find Lucy by uh, Dr. Donald Johansson, or Donald Johansson, I don't think he was a doctor at the time. He found it between 1972 and 1977, and he found a 40% complete skeleton, again, three million years old is what they dated it, and eight teeth characteristic, again, these are ape teeth, a uh, skull which shows ape-like cranial features, a knee joint that bends like our knee joint. Her left pelvic bone showed that she walked upright. And it's pretty impressive until you find out what's the rest of the story. Well, again, upper part of the skeleton, very ape-like, identical to a pygmy chim chimpanzee, but the knee joint is human. The pelvis, they had to do some grinding to fit it into everything, but again, human. Did they find the missing link? Well, how close to this ape skeleton was this knee joint found? That's a good question. In fact, it's a great question. It was asked on November 20th, 1986 at the University of Missouri, and Mr. Johansson was reluctant to answer that. Seems like a pretty straightforward question, right? Where You found this. How close did you find it? Well, he said the knee joint was found one and a half miles away and over 200 feet lower in the ground than the ape-like skeleton that he joined it to. Why does it fit together? Because you get no money for finding ape bones or human bones, but you get lots of money and publicity for finding ape men. That's the reason. You can go to museums today and you will see Australopithecus. You will see Lucy in the museums. It's not true. It's an orang orangutan. And again, for Lucy, you know, they, it may have been a pygmy cham chimpanzee. The knee joint was human. Didn't fit together, didn't belong together. So again, take out Australopithecus from the evolutionary charts. Java man, the coffee guy. No, he wasn't the coffee guy, but I like that. He was about 500,000 years in the past. Discovered on a South Pacific island of Java in 1891 by a Dutch physician by the name of Eugene Dubois. And he found an ape-like skull cap. And a year later, and 46 feet away from the first find, he found a human leg bone and two molar teeth. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, 30 years after the find, before his death, 
Dr. Dubois admitted that near the first find, he also found two fully human skulls and four human leg bones. How can you have fully human skeletons next to those that are evolving into humans? You can't. He concealed the evidence. He found a giant gibbon or ape. And it took 30 years for the truth to come out. So Java man obviously could be removed from the evolutionary charts. And then there's Peking man. Again, these are in, the, in museums today. 500,000 years old, found in a limestone hill 25 miles from Peking, China. And what they found was 30 skulls, but all 30 skulls had the ba their bases, the back of their heads, bashed in. They're small skulls, triangular in shape, resembling the skulls of great apes. And also in this location, they found an ash heap 23 feet deep from a furnace, and the heat from the furnace was so hot that it melted and fused the rock around it. Kind of hard for primitive man to do that unless maybe he wasn't primitive, right? Some other information that was held back was that there were six fully human skeletons that were excavated from the same area. They're the ones that built the furnace and used it. So all the evidence for this creature disappeared between 1941 and 1945. We have plaster of Paris models of the most complete skull. That's it. These are, again, our ape skulls. Well, what's going on here? In that part of the world, people eat monkeys. The problem is they don't eat monkey meat. Why? Because it's tough. What they would do after they caught a monkey was cut off its head, throw it in a pot of boiling water for a period of time, pull it out, bash in the skull, and eat the brain. So this creature was nothing more than a monkey whose brain served as man's meal. And the human bones found there were just human bones. And Peking man can be removed from the evolutionary charts. Neanderthal man, only 100,000 years ago. And the first skeleton was found in 1856 in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, Germany. And many skeletons have been found throughout Europe during that time. What did they find? Well, this skull showed thickened eyebrow ridges, uh, practically no chin. His jaw was bigger than the average jaw. The scar was lar skull was larger than average. His bones were thick. And his legs and back were curved causing him to walk bent over or hunchbacked. Oh, interesting. What's the problem with this creature being in the lineage of man? Well, in 1910, we found Neanderthal man living in the Philippines. What do I mean? He had the exact identical skeletal structure to Neanderthal man. You think, well, how could that be? Because they suffered from rickets. That was the problem. It, it's a vitamin D deficiency and arthritis, which would explain both the bony deformities. Western European Neanderthals are today's Western Europeans. So Neanderthal man is human. He's not an ape-like creature. Cro-Magnon man, 12,000 to 30,000 years ago. Skeletons found in France around 1868. Cave paintings also in 1940. And what they have, the evidence of what these creatures looked like, is an artist's conception. And they're in, essentially indistinguishable from modern Europeans today. When you look at their cave drawings, some of them are wearing hats. Their current women are carrying a purse. They have burial grounds. How primitive were these people? They weren't. Now, do some people today get isolated and live in caves and maybe are not as smart because they've left society and they're living all by themselves? Yeah, we see that all the time. But it doesn't mean it's an ape -like, they're an ape-like creature. So Cro-Magnon man can be removed. Piltdown man, 500,000 years ago, discovered in Piltdown, England by a physician, a physician named Charles Dawson, uh, 1912. And he found a man-like skull cap and an ape-like jawbone. So you just put them together, right? 41 years after this, this discovery in 1953, scientists discovered that there was a big problem with this evidence. Both the jaw and the skull were stained with iron salts to make them look old, and the teeth were filed down to make them look human. That was discovered a long time ago, 
and it was concealed. Why? Because that's their evidence for evolution. Piltdown man must be removed. You see how we're just picking these off pretty easily? It's not really hard. I love Nebraska Man. Nebraska Man is one of those funny ones for me. Uh, it was, he was discovered in 1922 by Henry Fairfield Osborne, a well-known anthropologist in western Nebraska. And he found a tooth. Oh, that's all he found was a tooth, okay? And in ju the June 24th, 1922 London News, Nebraska Man, with just the tooth that was found, was drawn as a primitive caveman, and even his wife was drawn with him. That's pretty good for one tooth. 1927, they found a tooth, a jaw, and a skeleton that belonged to Nebraska Man. Well, we need to change the name of Nebraska Man because it was really Nebraska Pig. That's what they discovered. The tooth was a pig's tooth, not an ape man. So you could take Nebraska man from the evolutionary charts. It's as simple as that. He's not even a man. Here's the thing, and it's so simple. If you look at the evidence that's out there, man was formed, fully formed, fully formed. When Adam was created, he was perfect. There was no defects in him until sin entered the world. And God created Adam from the elements that are found in the dust of the earth. And you could do a search on that. In fact, one writer said, what are the scientific proof that man's body came from the dust of the ground? As the Bible says, <clears throat> the human body is made up of materials and minerals found on the surface of the ground and not from the core of the earth. Oxygen being the most abundant element on the earth's crust or on the ground makes up 65% of the human body and carbon also abundant on the topsoil of the ground is 18% and hydrogen is 10%. The 59 elements found in the human body are all found on the earth's crust. This, amazing, this is amazing because what the Bible says perfectly matched the scientific composition of a human body. You know, it's interesting, they tell us, you're a creationist, you don't believe in science. No, I'm a creationist, and I totally believe in science, and I think the evidence that God created the heavens and earth is very scientifically proved. I don't have a problem with that. You, on the other hand, believe in an evolution, have a bigger problem because you're believing it by faith because there is absolutely no evidence for evolution or life coming from non-life. Now, man, when he was created, as well as all the animals, were not carnivorous. They didn't eat meat. That was later on that came in after the flood in Genesis 9, verses 1 through 7. But we can eat plants. They eat plants. Plants don't have a consciousness. You know, people freak out, you know, about everything nowadays, you know. They don't have a consciousness. So that's all they ate back then. Sin entered the world, and after the flood, God said, you may partake of meat. And that's, we see that with all of creation, Right? So in six days, all of creation was completed, and it was very good. But that's only six days. And I want to finish up quickly looking at the seventh day in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Was God tired? Is that why he had to rest? Absolutely not. He didn't need six days to create the heavens and the earth. Why did he do it? He was laying down a principle for us to follow. Man was to work six days, rest on the seventh day, giving it to the Lord to spend time with him and with their families. They worked hard in the fields. And they needed that day off. And it's interesting that the world follows what God established here in Genesis. A seven-day week, right? Perfection. Everything was complete perfect, like I said, until sin entered the world. Now, I'll deal quickly with the Sabbath day because people are 
you know, freaking out. You know, I've been called, said I'm, I'm going to hell because I've taken the mark of the beast and I've, I, we worship on a Sunday instead of the Sabbath and all that. But what do the scriptures tell us? Because that's really the most important thing. And I always ask people, convince me otherwise. Show me scripturally. Don't tell me what you believe. Just show me in the scriptures. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Again, what Paul's saying is, why are you focusing on the shadow? Those were all pictures of Christ. Their Sabbath rest on, on the Sabbath day. But now the substance is here. Jesus is here. Focus on him. Galatians 4, verses 9 through 11. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beagerly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years, and I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. You know, for me, every day should be set aside for the Lord. We should spend time with him every day, not just one day a week. But it doesn't matter. You could worship on a Saturday, on a Sunday, on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It doesn't matter. But take that time to spend with him. God doesn't need to rest. Man does. In fact, what did Jesus say in John 5, 17? My father has been working until now, and I have been working. God doesn't need to rest. If God rested, if he just kicked back and did nothing, we'd all be gone. But what a good principle to put into practice. Work and make sure you have at least one day of rest. And Dr. Richard Rortery, who teaches philosophy at the University of Virginia, listen to what he said. He said, secular professors in the universities ought to arrange things so that students who enter as bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. Did you hear that? What is the reason for getting these kids in the schools to stop them from being bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists by the time they leave college? He said, students are fortunate to find themselves under the benevolence of people like me and to have escaped the grip of their frightening, vicious, dangerous parents. You guys are vicious and dangerous by what you teach your children. We're going to go right on trying to discredit you parents in the eyes of your children, trying to strip your, your, your fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable or to examine or consider. Forget it. Don't even listen to your parents anymore. Do you wonder why so many kids, by the time they get out of college, don't even believe in God anymore? It's because these teachers are teaching them this. And I feel sorry for those that mess with God's kids. We have to take this battle seriously because they do. And they're training up our children. And if you doubt it, go look at what kids believe today. They don't believe in a God. They're so far from that. And my prayer as we've gone through this, and we've taken a lot of time going through this, because I believe it's important, but I hope I've stimulated you not to believe blindly, but you check out what people are saying. What I'm saying, to see if the script, what I'm saying is scripturally true or not. Look at the evidence. Don't believe blindly, because... We today have a social media that has all kinds of good information and all kinds of bad information mixed together. You know, years ago we had, you know, the cowboy movies with the good guys wearing the white hats and the, black, and the bad guys wearing the black hats, right? We knew who the good and bad guys were. You don't see that in cowboy movies anymore. You don't know who the good guys and bad guys anymore. And same with social media. You don't know who are good and bad. Be very careful. And I'll leave you with this, guys, to think about. When you look at the complexity of life that's out there, that there is a design to it, you have to come to a conclusion that there is a creator who not only designed all this, but put it all together. Or like we're told in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, exclamation mark, period. Whatever punctuation mark you want to put there. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for the men and women, the Christian men and women that are scientists that are examining the evidence and sharing these things with us. And for these evolutionists, Lord, who realize that evolution is impossible, and yet they reject you 
soften their hearts, open their eyes, help them to come to saving faith. And I pray for any that are here or listening on the radio or the internet that are struggling in this area. Lord, help them to see the truth. Help them to be convinced that you are a creator God. You created all things, all life. And Lord, your love for us is so tremendous. The variety of life that is out there is amazing. We thank you, Lord. And Lord, as we continue through Genesis over the next months, Lord, help us to understand these lessons you have for us, that we can apply them to our lives and grow in our walk with you. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.